Welcome to the January Ultrasound Case of the Month. My name is Greg Zahn, and I am an assistant professor and member of the Emergency Medicine Ultrasound Division. If you're new to the series, these cases highlight how ultrasound utilization helps take better care of our patients. Please remember to email me if you encounter an interesting case that should be highlighted. Thanks to Dr. Alan Barton and Dr. Sarah Kennedy for forwarding this case on. They were working together when the patient arrived by medic. He had called for transport to the emergency department with the chief complaint of right eye vision loss. He described this as being sudden and progressive over the past two days. His vision was described as only being able to see light and shapes. This vision complaint was particularly concerning for him given near blindness in his left eye at baseline, yet he had never experienced issues with his right eye. He denied trauma or precipitating causes of his vision complaints. His vital signs were unremarkable except for hypertension of 207 over 92. On physical exam, the eye was found to have extraocular movements intact, pupil was found to be 3 millimeters and reactive, and there was no evidence of anterior chamber pathology. Intraocular pressure was documented at 21. No scleral injection was noted. Visual acuity was unable to be obtained given his profound vision complaints, and he was unable to count fingers. Ophthalmoscopic examination was attempted, yet not successful given his constricted pupil and non-dilated exam. Thus, ultrasound was utilized at bedside to help farther classify this patient's source of vision loss. Here was the first image obtained. For those of you newer to ocular ultrasound, it can be initially intimidating, yet it is amazingly easy to perform. The eye is a fluid-filled structure, thus providing a great window for ultrasound. A healthy eye should have a posterior chamber that is hypoechoic or black. Even if you have limited experience, it is easy to see that the eye has hyperechoic abnormalities in the posterior chamber here. To help with anatomy, I include an ultrasound of a normal eye as a comparison. Here is a still shot of two separate normal ocular ultrasounds. The image on the left displays a clear picture of the anterior structures which include the cornea, anterior chamber, iris, and the lens. The image on the right displays the optic nerve, which can be utilized for optic nerve sheath diameter testing when you are concerned for the possibility of increased intracranial pressure. Both of these images clearly display no irregular echogenicity within the vitreous. While pathology is identified in the first image based upon the echogenicity in the vitreous, the physicians were able to increase the gain and obtain a better image. In this image, the abnormalities are more clearly defined. When you start, identify the relevant anatomy that we highlighted previously. This strategy helps you focus on the aspects of the image which display the pathology. I included a side-by-side -side comparison to help take advantage of this strategy. We can clearly see the important structures of the interior chamber, lens, vitreous, retina, and optic nerve. As I have mentioned, there is evidence of echogenicity of the vitreous. However, if you look closer, you will notice a more distinct area on the right side of the image that can be subtle compared to more impressive examples. I have highlighted this area, which represents a retinal detachment. We can see the well-demarcated linear echogenic focus that is consistent with the retinal attachment and likely the source of the vitreal hemorrhage. The hemorrhage can be seen displaying a minor swirling characteristic as the eye moves. The retinal attachment can be tracked back and appears to tether at the optic nerve, which is classic for this pathology. Given that his one good eye was affected, the patient was taken to surgery to intervene. His postoperative diagnosis was severe proliferative diabetic retinopathy, vitreous hemorrhage, and severe macula sparing tractional retinal attachment. His vision did improve, and he was ultimately discharged after a prolonged course to manage his accompanying medical comorbidities and social situation. While the extent of knowledge necessary in the emergency department to manage retinal attachment is beyond the scope of this talk, I will say that this case was slightly more subtle than some of the retinal attachments we have identified with ultrasound IU. I think ocular ultrasound is an incredible skill to have in supplementation to the remainder of our ocular examination. With waning skill with ophthalmoscopic examination for many providers, it is an incredibly useful tool to help take better care of our patients. In the next few slides, I give ultrasound examples of retinal attachments. In this view, we can see the echogenic flap with dark fluid both anterior and posterior to the retina. The patient is being asked to move their eye around, causing the flap to float and move in the fluid make identification easier. Here's another classic example of a retinal attachment. Again, as the patient moves the eye, we can see the detachment flap waving in the vitreous. This view also shows an important relationship of the retina with the optic nerve. We can see that the flap is tethered at the optic nerve, which is the dark hypochoic area 
that is posterior to the retina that comes into view as the patient looks left and right. The final exam is another classic ultrasound for retinal detachment. It shows the thick hyperechoic retina floating in the vitreous. Similar to the last image, we can see tethering at the optic nerve, the hypochoic area posterior to the eye that flashes into view as the eye moves. There are a few learning points as it relates to retinal detachment ultrasound. With any ultrasound ocular application, use an abundance of gel to facilitate the scan. You should be floating the probe in the gel and not pressing on the eye. Make sure to increase the gain to see subtle abnormalities which could otherwise be missed. As the video showed, have the patient move the eye around by looking left and right and up and down. This can help a subtle detachment flap flow into the ultrasound view. And finally, I want to address image interpretation. Dr. Matt Roots and I recently published a commentary in Academic Emergency Medicine critiquing an ultrasound for retinal detachment study. The evidence clearly shows that ultrasound has an impressively high positive likelihood ratio for retinal attachment, which greatly assists our bedside decisions. Sensitivity is often cited in the upper 90s, yet can suffer if retinal attachments are misclassified as a vitreous hemorrhage or vitriol detachment. Retinal detachments are often more echogenic, thicker, less mobile, and tethered at the optic nerve. However, complete differentiation of retinal pathology versus vitreal pathology is beyond the scope of this case. To help simplify things for the novice user, I feel the evidence supports that a negative scan for any posterior echogenicity nearly rules out detachment as long as one is detailed and systematic with scanning. Thus, for the novice ultrasonographer, I teach that any posterior echogenicity is abnormal and should be investigated farther with a discussion with ophthalmology. Thanks for your time and attention. Hopefully you grab the ultrasound for your next ocular complaint and show yourself just how easy this scan is to perform.